as you would know, we're in this theme as a church, um, the book of Psalms. And, and this is a pretty broad theme. And, and, and I know that there would have been um, a lot of messages and a lot of really different messages. Um, but we're going to just jump straight in tonight because I'm sure mine will be different again. And um, if we have our Bibles, we can open there. I'm going to be jumping to and from different um, passages, but we will mainly be camping in the book of Psalms. So if you open your Bibles, you can open them straight to the book of Psalms, and we will start there. Thank you, worship team. You're amazing. Um, Psalm 33, verse 8. It'll be on the screen behind me. Let all the earth fear the Lord, and let all the people of the world revere Him. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere Him. The title of my message tonight is Relationship, Reverence, Revival. Relationship, Reverence, Revival. Let me pray. God, I just thank you so much that you are here, Father. Lord God, we thank you that your spirit is alive and is well. Lord God, would you reveal that which needs to be revealed? Would you heal that which needs to be healed? God, would you restore that which needs to be restored tonight? Holy Spirit, we just want to go where you want to go. So would you do what you want to do here in this place tonight? In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Awesome. So about eight years ago, I had a conversation with a friend and that friend asked me, they said, what do you think, Ruben, what do you think it would take to see revival break out around us? And that's a pretty big question. That's a pretty broad question. And I was like, "Mm, well, um, I I think people just need to love God more. That was my response. People just need to love God more because I would see Christians and good Christians, people who I loved, um, be taken out by sin and, and, and lose everything. They'll lose their, their ministry, they'll lose their marriages, they'll lose their, their families. And, and, and I'll catch up with these people and I'll be like, man, what's going on? Like, what happened? When did you lose your love for God? Why'd you stop loving God? And their answer was always, I never stopped loving God. What are you talking about? I never fell out of love with God. I made a mistake, but I never stopped loving God. And I soon came to realize that it wasn't actually a lack of love for God, but it was a lack of reverence for God. That there was not a love problem, there was a reverence problem. And so reverence isn't cool anymore, especially for people our age. Reverence isn't cool. The fear of God isn't cool. It's not a buzzword. It's not, it's not love or blessing. So we hear this word reverence and we kind of go, or the, we hear this statement fear of God and we kind of go, oh, that's, that, that's irrelevant, that's an Old Testament thing. And, 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 we, and we hear the word fear and we put it all under one umbrella and we call them all bad. And we don't talk about it. But tonight we're going to talk about it. Because I think it's not just a good idea, but I think it's imperative that as a church we understand and are able to walk in the healthy fear of God, to revere God. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to jump straight in and, and discuss that. But it was about three years ago I had this encounter with God that literally had me on the floor just weeping and weeping and weeping. It was in my, in my, living, in my living room, and, and Mel can attest to this. But I had this encounter where, where, where I just saw the magnitude and, and the magnificence and, and, and the might of God, and, and I was so undone. I was, I was literally flat on my face, and, and I spent the next two hours there, which I thought was like five minutes, but I spent the next two hours there, and God was just showing me all these things. And, and I'd never experienced um, God in that way before. I'd never experienced the, 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 the reverence and the might of God in that way before. And Mel actually like peeled me off the carpet and I had like this big ball of snot and, and, and tears on the carpet. Um, but that encounter changed my life. It changed the way I spoke. It changed the way I saw God. It changed the way I saw sin. It changed the way I pastored. It's that I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty easygoing guy. I'm a pretty cruisy guy. So a lot of the times, if someone came to me with something that wasn't really a big deal, I saw it wasn't a big deal, I'd, just be like, oh, oh, I'd brush it off. I'd be like, you do you, boo. That's what I'd say. You do you, boo. 
And after this encounter, after that, that encounter I had on that floor, I went from saying, you do you, boo, to literally grabbing my friends by the hands and saying, no, 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 please don't go down that path. It does not lead to life. And I'll say to them, I'll, I'll be like, I'm, I'm not saying this because I hate you. I'm saying this because I love you, but I hate the sin that is attached to your life. And it's that when we have a deep reverence for God, our eyes are open to loving what He loves and to hating what He hates. We love what He loves and we hate what He hates. So today we're going to look at this theme and this theme, the fear of God, it runs right through the book of Psalms from the front to the back and, and, and we're, going to, we're, going, we're going to camp there tonight. But let me start by saying this and get the cat out of the bag at the start of the night is that the fear of the Lord is not being scared of God. The fear of the Lord is not being scared of God. For how can we have an intimate relationship with somebody that we are afraid of? And I love what John Bevere says. He says this, he says, the fear of God isn't being scared of God, it's being afraid of being away from God. The fear of God isn't being scared of God, it's being afraid of being away from God. It's that being scared of God will make us run away from Him but the fear of God will make us run to Him. So we know that the fear of the Lord isn't being scared of God. So let me say tonight what the fear of the Lord actually is, and that will be on the screens behind me. The fear of the Lord is being in awe of God. The fear of the Lord is holding Him in the highest esteem. The fear of the Lord is seeing God as all-loving, almighty, and all-powerful. The fear of the Lord is having a deep respect and a deep reverence for God. The fear of the Lord is living with an awareness that God sees all things, that He hears all things, and that He knows all things. And I'm not going to lie, this kind of stopped me from getting into a lot of strife as a kid. Because I like had this weird thought that my parents would see all things, know all things, and hear all things. And I thought they were in like some little bubble following me, following me around everywhere. And the kids at school would even be like, man, your parents aren't going to find out, just do it. And I'm like, trust me, my parents will find out. And I got an African daddy, and you don't want him to find out. It's all over when he finds out. I remember I brought, uh, I brought friends home from school once, after school. And we went straight into the backyard and we started playing. And, and someone earlier that day had dropped off um, like sausage rolls from bakery and they're on the kitchen bench and we're playing in the backyard. And my friend's like, oh man, I'm so hungry. Can I go and like have some of those sausage rolls? So I like lean over and I'm looking like making sure my dad isn't in the kitchen. And I'm like, yeah, that's all good, bro. Go, go like help yourself. Because my dad was upstairs. And then he walked in and he just started smashing these sausage rolls, man, like one after the other. He's just like, boom, 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 eating these sausage rolls. And my dad walked in and, and like busted him. And, and he calls out to me, he's like, Ruben, Ruben. And, and I'm in the backyard, I'm like, oh, man, I'll come in. And he's like, look at your friend. Look at your friend. He's eating like a thief. He's eating like a thief. Eat it. And I was like, oh, whoa, relax. And he's like, where were you? Were you ratchet? Where were you? What are you doing? I was like, oh. I was like, relax. I didn't want to get on his wrong side. And I remember one time when, when my younger brother, Josh here, was actually naughty in class once. I don't know if you remember this, Josh, but you're naughty in class. You probably wiped that out of your memory. Um, but the teacher was like, I've had enough with you. I've had enough of your attitude. You're leaving my class. Got out of the class and was like, I'm calling your dad. And then Josh was like, please, please, please don't call my dad. Starts so crying. And, and then his friends saw that and they came out of class as well. They're like, sir, please do anything to him. Do anything to us. But please, just don't call his dad. <laughs> don't call his dad. Is that there are two types of fears. There are healthy fears and there are unhealthy fears. And tonight I want to start by looking at unhealthy fears. And it's that we live in a world that is full of unhealthy fears. And you don't have to go far or live long to notice this. 
You can just turn on the TV for five seconds or you can just jump onto social media or head down to your local store and you know that we live in a world full of fear full of the fear of, of, of man, or the fear of dying, or the fear of pandemics, or the fear of losing our jobs, or the fear of losing our homes, or, or, or the fear of doctor's reports, or the fear of what others will think, or the fear of not being enough, is that there are so many fears out there. And the reason why I think that humanity is so riddled with fear is because we fear God so little. And that's why reverence is so important because what it does is it, it zooms in on God and it keeps Him seated on the throne of our hearts. And, and, and it, even when the world's going chaotic around us, it helps us to fix our eyes on Him. Is that without reverence, we see God as a meal ticket to heaven. Without reverence, we live without boundaries. Without reverence, we flirt with sin and, and, and we toe the line and we ask that question, we say, how far can we go and still get into heaven? How far can we go without it being sin? And this kind of like breaks my heart when I, when, when I hear that way of life, all that, all that question, because I automatically think of a husband saying to a wife, hey, how far can I go with another woman before that becomes adultery? Is it holding hands? Is it being home before midnight? And you can imagine how she would feel. Is that a lack of reverence will have us in the clubs on a Saturday night and in church on a Sunday morning? The lack of reverence will have us speaking Christian lingo and not living Christ-like. I once had someone say to me that they don't have to live Christ-like because they confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart that Jesus is Lord and, and that secured their spot in heaven so they don't need to live Christ-like. My friends, that's why it's so important that we partner relationship with reverence. Relationship has to be partnered with reverence. It's not either or, it is both end. Relationship alone will have us becoming way too familiar with God and only seeing Him as a friend and as a bro and as a buddy. And reverence alone will have us so disconnected from God that we will think of Him as a, as a distant figure and one who doesn't desire an intimate relationship with us. So it's imperative that we marry the two, relationship and reverence. Relationship and reverence. Turn to the person next to you and say, relationship and reverence. Relationship and reverence, they're a match made in heaven. We have to marry the two. And if you haven't married the two tonight, you better start walking down that aisle because they need to be married. We need to have those two together, relationship and reverence. So we know there are unhealthy fears, but there are also healthy fears. For example, the fear of me being stung by a wasp will stop me from going up to a wasp nest and poking my finger into that nest. And so this fear of God that I'm speaking about tonight is a healthy fear. And not only is it a healthy fear, but is it, a fear, it is a fear that overcomes every other fear. It is a fear that eradicates every other fear. And, and, and I've got this quote that's going on the screen behind me by Charles Spurgeon. And it says this, he who, he who fears God has nothing else to fear. He who fears God has nothing else to fear. And I want to back that up in, in Scripture tonight. And, and all these Scriptures that I'm using, they're going to be on the screen behind me, but they're all from this book of Psalms. <clears throat> the first one says, Fear the Lord, you His holy people, for those who fear Him lack nothing. So the fear of the Lord eradicates the fear of lack. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. The fear of the Lord eradicates the fear of being bound. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. The fear of the Lord eradicates the fear of not knowing that you're loved. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. That the fear of the Lord eradicates the fear of not being heard. God, right now, I just pray that your healthy fear washes over us tonight, Father. 
Lord God, and overcomes and eradicates every unhealthy fear present in this room right now. God, whether it's a fear of a doctor's report, God, whether it's a fear of not being able to pay a bill, whatever that fear is, God, would your healthy fear come down and wash through this place right now, God? Lord, from the front of the auditorium to the back, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to jump into the, over into the book of Genesis now, the first book in the Bible, and, and, and we see early on a man who, who, who had a- absolute fear and deep reverence for God, and his name is Abraham. And he exemplifies what it is to have relationship and, and reverence with God. And we know the story where he goes up to the mountain, he's asked God, asked him to sacrifice his one and only son. And we start the, we pick it up here in Genesis 22, two to three. And this is God speaking to Abraham. He says, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and, his, uh, and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. The scripture tells us here that reverence leads to obedience. Reverence leads to obedience. So Abraham got up straight away and he went. And sometimes I wonder, I'm like, if that was us, would that have been like, okay, God, let me just pray about that for a few days. God, let me go tell 101 other people about that. Let me just sit on that for a bit. But I see this beautiful dynamic relationship between God and Abraham, where there's relationship and there's reverence. And and it reminds me of when I was a young boy and I was growing up with my dad and my dad would ask me to do something and bang, straight away I would get up and do it. And we see here, God asks Abraham, one of the most impossible tasks, a hard task is saying, Abraham, would you take your one and only son and would you go and sacrifice him? And Abraham, hearing this hard task, his response is, God, say no more. And he saddles his donkey and he heads off first thing in the morning. It's that reverence leads to obedience. And then we keep reading and, and, and we see that Abraham takes his son, Isaac. He puts him on, the, on that altar and he's, he's got his knife and he's about to sacrifice him. And the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. He said, here I am. It's that reverence gives us an ear to hear. Reverence gives us an ear to hear. And I wonder how many um, Isaacs we've sacrificed on that altar because we haven't been listening to God. Or how many, sacrif- uh, how many Isaacs we've sacrificed because we haven't heard God. And that reverence gives us an ear to hear. And then we go on and, and, and the angel of the Lord says to Abraham, he says, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. For now I know that you fear God and since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. The angel of the Lord, I I find it interesting that angel of the Lord didn't say, now that I know that you are a great pastor or now that I know that you are a great life group leader, now that I know that you are a great worship leader, or now I know that you are a great evangelist or preacher, he said, now I know that you fear God. And this is Abraham. This is Abraham, a man that had no Bible, a man that had no Holy Spirit living in him, a man that had no Ten Commandments, a man that had no pastor, a man that had no church. But what he did have is he had a relationship with God and he had a deep reverence for God that led him to being one of the most blessed men on earth. Reverence also leads to blessing. If we want to live a blessed life, then we've got to revere God. You know, I think 
sometimes we just have too many excuses and we play the blame game and we blame God, we, we blame theology, we blame doctrine and we even blame the devil. But sometimes I think it just comes down to poor character and lack of discipline. And we just need to get alone with God and, and let the Word of God transform us. We need to get alone with Him and, and read those red letters and, and let the blood of Jesus wash over us. Just as Candace was speaking about tonight, the blood of Jesus. Who's grateful for the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus, that speaks a better word. That saves, that heals, that redeems, that restores that washes us clean. Who's grateful for the blood of Jesus? I pray the blood of Jesus over everything in my life. I pray it over my family. I pray it over my household. I pray it over my friends. And I grab you tonight. I'm praying the blood of Jesus over you. I'm praying the blood of Jesus over your family. I'm praying the blood of Jesus over your finances. God, would you wash through this place tonight, Jesus? God, would you fill every seat with your precious blood, God? Your precious blood, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. You might be thinking, hey Reuben, how does this all tie in with the New Testament? Let me show you. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. I, I pray tonight that as, as we leave this building and temptation comes our way, I, I pray that when we, when we find ourselves alone in front of that computer, or in front of that TV, or we find ourselves in that place that we've been invited to, but it doesn't sit easy in our spirit, or we find ourselves in that place with those friends who don't yet know Christ, I pray in it all, would we be a people and would we be a church that would do what is pleasing to God? Will we live a life that is pleasing and honouring to God? Will we choose to walk in the light as He is in the light? Would we choose to live a life that is a cut above? Would we choose to be pure in heart? Would we choose to not defile that which God has built in us? Will we choose to live holy lives? Would we choose to live upright? Will we choose every day to live a life pleasing and honouring to our God? You know, Gypsy Smith, he's a, he was a late revivalist and, and he was asked this question. He was asked the question, what is the secret to revival? And he said this. He said, go home, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle, hop inside that circle and pray, God, would you revive everything in this circle? It's that revival starts with us. Revival starts with us. And it's not that revival is a message because revival is not the message. Jesus is the message. But the revival is a response of hearts that are so full and so surrendered to Jesus. And if we want to see revival in our nation, it starts with us. It starts with you and I getting on our knees before God and, and learning how to commune with Him and, and getting into a, a, a relationship with Him and, and learning how to revere Him as God because He is the King of all kings and He's the Lord of all lords. He's the head and not the tail. He's above and not beneath. He's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is unmatched. He is in a league of His own, that He is God. He is God. So tonight, let me, let me close with the same verse that I opened with. That says, let all, the, let all the earth fear the Lord and let all the people of the world revere Him. Let's close our eyes and, and bow our heads. Tonight, I want to give an opportunity for those to come to Christ who don't know Him yet. 
You might be sitting here and your heart is like pounding. You're like, man, what is going on? That is God knocking the door of your heart. And say He loves you more than anyone could ever love you. He knows you more than anyone could ever know you. And He desires a relationship with you. He's not angry at you. He's not mad at you. In fact, He's waiting for you with arms open wide. And maybe that's you tonight. You don't know God, but you want to know Him. You desire a relationship with Him. You want to commit your life to Him. Or maybe you're here and you've walked away from God, but you want to recommit your life to Him, come back to Him. I want to give you this opportunity tonight. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And I'm not doing this to embarrass you. I just want to see who I'm praying with tonight. So if that's you on the count of three, one, two, three. Awesome, I see that hand. I see that hand in the middle. I see the hand down the front. I'm looking from the very left to the very, I see that hand at the back left. I see that hand in the middle, thank you. Looking to the right, from the front to the back. I see that hand, thank you. Amazing. God, I thank you for each and every single hand that went up tonight, Father. Lord God, I thank you that you saw their hearts, Father. Lord, that you knew what was destined for their life before they even took their first breath here on earth, God. Lord, it was no accident that they found themselves here tonight. So God, we just ask that you reveal yourself to them, God. Father, when they walk out of these doors, they would experience you in a way they never have before, God. Lord, in the, in the little mundane areas of life, God, would you just show up in powerful ways, Lord. Lord, speak to them. Lord, pour out your love on them, God. Father, I thank you that tonight they have chosen, chosen sorry, to leave the old behind and to pick up the new life that you have for them, God. They've chosen to fix their eyes on you and devote their lives to you, God. And we thank you for them tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen and Amen. Hey, let's give it up for every single decision here tonight.